What we're checking out here today is one of our RPS 82s. It's doing really great base detection predominantly used for drones. We want to have the flexibility for the warfighter to take the detection capability and then employ it in whatever way they'd like to. A lot of these being implemented and deployed in areas of conflict today. Rapidly evolving threats are defining conflicts around the world, creating ever increasing technology challenges for warfighters to maintain mobility and autonomy on the battlefield, while also remaining nimble and connected to the most advanced command and control networks. I'm Guy Taylor, National Security Editor at The Washington Times, and for this edition of the Threat Status Influencer Series, we're in Germantown, Maryland, at a key tactical expeditionary radar production facility of Leonardo DRS, a world-class defense technology company that's delivering cost-effective advanced radars that integrate with the full range of equipment used by warfighters. We're lucky to be joined by Charlene Caputo. She's Vice President of Business Development here at Leonardo DRS, and she has unique insight into how the company has truly moved the ball on radars in this era of small drones, drone swarms, and evolving missile threats. Charlene, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Guy. I really appreciate it. What's the biggest challenge in the world right now with regard to battlefield threats and how is Leonardo DRS delivering solutions in real time? So DRS right now is really trying to get ahead of that ever evolving threat of drone mitigation. And on our end, we're doing the detection, identification and classification. So trying to stay ahead of that pacing threat and doing that proactively. And also as part of that, trying to provide warfighters with equipment that's very high TRL maturity, that's ready for them to use, that's easy for them to use, and that gets the mission done. Leonardo DRS has been a leader specifically in the development and deployment of a new breed of advanced portable radars. You've got experience basically forged in what's been going on in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East. Where are these radars being used today and what specific capability gaps are these systems addressing for U.S. and allied forces? So right now our systems are deployed in multiple areas of conflict. As mentioned, um, areas of the Middle East, we're also uh, heavily focused in Eastern Europe right now um, as what's being called kind of the Eastern flank area. Uh, very highly focused there. We have active systems there um, doing their job daily. Um, really what's been happening is we've really taken an approach to having a, again, a very high mature type system that's able to detect a various range of threats, sometimes simultaneously and at a very high capability level. So their mobility and capability in terms of deployment, getting onto vehicles, getting onto mobile platforms, static platforms, providing that situational awareness for the warfighter to then take proactive action in terms of what are they seeing and what actions do they need to take to get ahead of that threat is kind of what keeps us up at night. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of really rapid innovation, because we're talking about a changing battle space technologically. What can you tell us about innovation and speed when it comes to creating agility in these radar systems? So because we are combat proven and are fielded today, mm. we have the, the benefit of taking some of that data real time and then analyzing that. And then from some of those lessons learned, we're able to implement a new software baseline or implementation to help the soldiers and warfighters do their job and do it well. So a lot of analysis, recognizance work, anything that we're able to kind of discern between active combat mm -hmm. and then take that, it's really been extremely helpful for us in terms of making systems better, more capable. And a lot of that's done very, very quickly mm -hmm. and you know, almost on a daily basis at times. And can you give us an example of any unique aspects of technology that are being leveraged across different sensing capabilities? So I think the ability to be able to um, detect some Thing and then actually say within a very high degree of confidence of, yes, this is something that needs to take, someone needs to take action on. Identifying whether a drone is actually a threat or exactly. not. Exactly. And yeah. also just in terms of saying, hey, there's a drone here. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, other biological threats, birds, other things can, depending on the location, can be very difficult to discern between. Mm -hmm. um, so just in terms of saying, hey, this is a drone, 
um, being able to identify that and then saying, here is the RCS values. This is how fast this threat is coming at us. Um, sometimes you only have moments of time to take an action and you want to make sure that what you're taking an action on is something that's worth your effort and worth maybe a kinetic effector that could be very cost effective. So tell me a little bit more specifically about how tactical radars are, are actually fielded. Are we talking about on top of existing conventional systems? Or what types of vehicles can they be mounted on, really? So we're really not limited in the way that we mount our systems. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what you need is a GPS or an INS to tell the system where it is in relation to where it needs to look. We can be on vehicles, so JLTV, MITV, um, Striker vehicles, Bradley vehicles. Um, we're really not limited to any wheeled or tracked vehicle. In terms of uh, maritime applications, we can go on onboard ship sets, on uh, small cutters. We're really not limited in that regime either. And then in terms of uh, building placement, we can be on tops of buildings. Charlene, with regard to the myriad of ways in which radars can be fielded and mounted on different platforms in the field, I, I was lucky enough to have caught up with you recently at the Association of the U.S. Army Convention, AUSA 2025 in Washington, D.C., where you walked me through some of the actual radars that Leonardo had on display. We had a pretty interesting discussion there. This system right here is our multi-spectral tower. It provides S-band capability and X-band capability. So it's doing track and search. And then with the X-band capability, it's providing a unique fire control capability. So let's just say they see something, a cruise missile, a drone from 40, 60 kilometers. Yeah. They can actually then, you know, tee up this X-band system to put some type of potential kinetic on it. Wow. And what you're seeing is really kind of a comprehensive air picture that has a really high fidelity track. Mm -hmm. We've also got an optic place on top. So there's also an additional layer of sensor fusion to be able to kind of ingest all those sensors into one cohesive track. And again, allows the warfighter to take proactive measures, sure. allows them to, to to take proactive action on what they're seeing. Okay. And, um, you know, then they're using that kinetic in the most effective way. And then over here. So this is a JLTV. Yeah. We're using the RPS-42 on that. It's really doing short-range air defense. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're agnostic in the approach, so we've also employed this on the Striker as part of the shore at platform for the Army. So okay. short-range air defense, um, and these ones are traditionally doing drones, I would say probably a six to eight kilometer range. So y you brought up uh, this drone proliferation situation. And this is really, I, I've identified this as a major theme for AUSA 2025. Everybody's got some kind of a drone platform. What's interesting here is the counter drone challenge, as you say. Can you tell me a little bit more specifically about how these Leonardo DRS systems are addressing that kind of critical air defense gap with, uh, with drones? Certainly. So the systems are software defined. So what's happened kind of, and I 100% agree with you, over time, yeah. what we traditionally were seeing as drone warfare has really kind of evolved into some of these, you know, as I said before, kind of some low flyers, much larger drones with significant payloads on them. The systems are software defined. Yeah. So essentially the, the system will say, here, here are the things we want to detect and then kind of throw away the rest. So clutter, false tracks, you know, birds, biologic threats. Oh, okay. uh, so our systems are able to, because of some of the, the, intelligence gathering that we're gaining from the user community mm -hmm. and some of the fielded applications, yeah. we're taking that that recognizance, that some of that intel, yeah. and then employing it onto the radar. So from a hardware perspective, you're going to continue to use the same hardware platform. If we're adjusting and, and dynamically adjusting to the, the evolving threat mm -hmm. uh, daily, weekly, and it's been really helpful in terms of, you know, seeing some of these, you know, adversaries we come up with really sophisticated drone attacks mm -hmm. You know, swarms, sure. um, loitering munitions. Identifying them Correct. early. Yeah. Correct. Identify them early and then informing the warfighter of like, this is a real imminent threat and you need to take proactive action. There's Are you prepared. There's also this end to end aspect that I want to ask you about. Leonardo DRS really promotes its capability as uh, providing end-to-end -end capability. What does that mean exactly when it comes to radars? So initially, we were really just looking at the detect part. So really, the radar is going to provide the initial detect. What we're seeing, though, is that people want a comprehensive system that'll start from the detection. So you need to have clear eyes to see what's coming in, uh, take that information, ingest it, um, being able to synthesize that data, and then try and act on it. So uh, we're really doing the whole comprehensive end-to-end -end solution. So anything from the initial detection to the end goal of taking that threat out by whatever means, kinetic, non-kinetic, um, we're kind of prepared to provide that. 
and then provide a comprehensive air picture that then can feed into some larger systems that can be ingested into the overall air picture. Charlene, can we dig actually deeper now into the extent to which Leonardo DRS radars integrate into end-to-end -end systems, or do they operate independently? And what's the importance of end-to-end -end mission systems? What does that actually mean? So Rod has really taken an approach to being flexible as far as integration is concerned. So we can actually provide a larger end-to-end -end system organically on our own. We can also leverage other existing systems. So some of those are government uh, provided equipment. Um, some of those are also larger components or, or well-known systems that are fielded today that we can integrate into. We've really taken this um, flexible dynamic approach uh, of being able to integrate into a pre-existing system or just having our own organic capability at hand. And so with regard to end-to-end -end radar, just for the audience that doesn't really know that terminology, what specifically do you mean by end-to-end? -end? So we're doing the full chain. So it's detect, identify, classify, and then we would hand that off to potentially an optic that would do a slew to cue that would essentially say, hey, I'm going to do a visual confirmation that this threat is actually this threat. And then you would employ either a kinetic or non-kinetic option or some other capability set that would then either just provide situational awareness or actually put some type of kinetic on target. It's really, it, it's really integrated directly into the chain of command communication. Correct. And I would say that just from a radar perspective, if you're not doing the real detection up front, mm. you're going to be hard pressed to do anything further from that. So I really feel like we're the first step, but the most critical step to identify threats. What about artificial intelligence and other adaptable software, uh, you know, what advantage does AI bring to the customer at this point? And is it actually integrated now into the technology? Uh, how does it affect capability? So right now we're taking an AI approach to um, provide some uh, capability, enhanced capability for the radars to definitively say that, yes, something is a threat or something is not. And so for those things that are not, which we would call probably clutter, um, which can be a, you know, a bird, a biologic threat, or maybe just trees or some type of um, other things that we would classify as clutter, that will essentially throw those away in terms of the, the field of view that the operator is looking at. Mm -hmm. And so they can really focus and prioritize on the threats at hand. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that's done inherent to the radar. So again, the onus and the, the work that's required of the warfighter mm -hmm. is limited to seeing what's really identified as a real threat. And it allows them to, to save time to make informed decisions and just to be more proactive in their approach. What's the connection here to US-based manufacturing? Um, you've talked about Leonardo DRS's really global footprint. We're here at this facility in Germantown, Maryland. Let's take a look around. I, I, and what can you show me about what's being made here? Why is it relevant, particularly with regard to this facility? So I'll, I'll take you into the, the production bay area. Um, this is kind of like the final QA process, mm -hmm. just to make sure everything's kind of configured in the proper way. So some ACHR systems, a lot of those, again, are used for drone detection. Um, and then we actually have a larger system. This is our RPS-42, mounted onto vehicles, static platforms, onto sides of buildings. This is our RPS-202, much longer range capability. Again, you're going to see further ranges. We're also using this for cruise missile detection in addition to drones. What are we roughly talking about in terms of what it costs? There are very exquisite, very expensive systems that are out there doing a similar job. Yeah. We're providing these at a literally a fraction of the cost. Interesting. Um, yeah. And in some scenarios, uh, you know, they're attributable, right? They might mm -hmm. be taken out by an adversary. Uh, you certainly don't want to be taken out by an adversary with a $20, 30000000 million radar. One of those very large, exquisite systems is taken out, and now you have no visibility whatsoever. So you're essentially blind. What's next for Leonardo DRS? And what's the importance here of cost effectiveness? And how does this whole manufacturing setup undergird cost effective solutions, given how the battle space is evolving so rapidly on the technological front? We've really tried to take a proactive approach to producing systems here that are low cost, high capability, essentially supporting the warfighter in the best ability that we possibly can. Uh, we're thrilled to be here in Germantown, Maryland, to be providing those systems. Um, and we're looking forward to supporting the warfighter today and every day. Charlene Caputo, so interesting, so insightful. Thank you for joining this edition of the Threat Status Influencer Series. Guys, so glad to have you here today. We are thrilled to have you, so thanks so much.
And thank you to Leonardo DRS for this inside look at some of the most fascinating, advanced and impactful technology in the defense industrial realm. I'm Guy Taylor, until next time.